Welcome to the continuation of the session on application of biostatistics in Ayurveda research. In the previous part, we have briefly seen some of the important or the vital areas where we can apply the basics, no, basic knowledge of biostatistics in various types of Ayurveda research. So we can summarize or we can focus some of the important areas into the various uh, aspects like the application of biostatistics can be applied in study design for selecting the sampling methods for the calculation of the sample size and most importantly to select the appropriate statistical test or the method in various types of studies and of course in writing a synopsis or writing a dissertation or a thesis and also equally important in a scientific writing or publication. So these are some of the important areas where we can apply biostatistics in research. So we will try to go in detail about each one of them and try to cover some of the basic aspects of all of them starting with the first point the study design. So what do you mean by a study design and what are these study designs and how they are relevant in Ayurveda research. So these study designs are the structured approach which address the specific research question. So based on the research question, we can select or we can design the appropriate study method which can address or answer these questions. Like for example, if you want to do a survey study and if you want to answer how many people are suffering with Tikshnagni or what is the prevalence of the people of Vata Prakriti in the population. How many of them are having Kura Koshta in the population? And suppose you want to answer this question, you may not have to do any intervention studies. A very large population observation epidemiological studies need to be done. And that is where the selecting the appropriate study design is very very crucial or important in any research. So this study design provide general guidance for thinking about the specific aspect of the study conduct like the sampling population, systematically collecting the measurements and analyzing the data. But each of these methods or each of these design has their own advantage and disadvantage. The strength and limitation of the specific designs are well established. So based on the different types of study questions, so there are there could be different types of study designs. Like for example, if you are looking for a descriptive study design, the generally the question would be what is the prevalence of the condition Z in a specific population? Like how many people are suffering with diabetes? Or see, we always look about the statistics available, what is the prevalence rate or incidence rates available for various diseases. How do we get this information? This information are gathered by various studies which has been done based on this research designs. So it can help you to understand what is the prevalence of a particular condition in a particular area, in a particular community, in a particular population or can have analytical studies. Maybe you can always find out what could be the various risk factors associated with the conditions. Now we always see, suppose we have hypertension, diabetes, obesity, we always have a list of risk factors which has been enumerated in various textbooks. How they find it out? It is through these study designs by the help of maybe case control study designs or cohort studies which they do by using the appropriate. So even in Ayurveda also such study designs maybe like a case control study design. For example, suppose you want to know whether the consumption of the curd causes Kapha Jakasa, the Kapha type of cough, whether it is caused because of the excessive consumption of curds. Suppose you want to know this, you can easily answer this question by designing a, a case control study. So what do you mean by this case control? It's like you will have the outcome which are called as cases and you also have the risk factors which are called as the causative factors. So this for example you can design a 2 into 2 table where you have the case which is the, the kapha type of cough here or kapha de kasa 
and you could have two possibilities those who consume curds and those who not consume curds you also need to compare with the controls controls are those people who are quite similar to that of patients suffering with the kapha type of cough but only difference is they do not have this disease called as cough other than this all their basic demographical profile is quite similar and again in the control also there are two possibilities those who are consuming curds and those who do not consuming curds so there are these four options those having suffering with kafaja kasa who are consuming curds who are not consuming curds and the controls who are consuming curds who are not consuming curds and if you have the data of this and if you are able to analyze them you will be clearly able to say whether the curd is a causative factor or a risk factor for causing the kafa type of kasa or kafa type of cough so that is where based on different types of questions based on different types of research question you can design different study designs so these are the things that you should be aware of whenever you are doing any studies on ayurveda and at the same time probably also develop the some diagnostic test because we fail in having a diagnostic criteria for various diseases like how to diagnose uh, kapha jakasa or how to diagnose tamaka shwasa how to diagnose sandhivata and what should be the diagnostic criteria as per ayurvedic parameters what could should be the major criteria minor criteria essential criteria sometimes we lack a lot in this so probably we can also develop the diagnostic criteria or whether this particular method is appropriate to diagnose that particular condition whether this how good is the test q in detecting the condition z whether this diagnostic method is as good as the prevailing questionnaire or prevailing method of diagnosing condition or suppose you come up with a new uh, vaccine or any of the medicine whether it is useful so that is where suppose you want to develop any diagnostic test so probably you should understand the concept of the sensitivity and the specificity of a test which we are going to talk in the future classes so so these are the some of the basic things that you should know about the research designs see there are broad categories of options available in study designs uh, these study designs could be cross section study designs which are very often the the survey studies now it is cross sectional refers to one time studies they are called as snapshot study designs because it is one time analysis of the the information about the uh, participant where you are trying for example how many patients are suffering with uh, hemorrhoids or how many of them are suffering with fissure in ano suppose you would like to know in the hospital those patients who are visiting your hospital so you can have this data with you or sometimes there could also be the study design called case reports like even a single case study which could be unique in terms of its manifestation in terms of its uh, uh, diagnosis in terms of its intervention in terms of its outcome suppose you find some there is something uniqueness in a study that you have come across and this also can be reported and this can be uh, published in various journals and suppose you have some sub, such group of case reports or case studies they can be formulated into case series maybe a series of four similar cases or eight such similar cases or 10 such similar cases can be studied and they could be studied and published as uh, discussed earlier you can also do the case control study which is a prospective uh, or sorry a retrospective study based on the observations it's observational retrospective studies and you also have something called as prospective observation studies which is a cohort study like for example in this we have a, a risk factor or a causative factor which you are going to see whether this ends up in some outcome like for example whether regular use of swarnamrita prashna reduces the risk of the recurrent respiratory infection and so again so we'll have there'll be two into two table so you will have the swarnamrita prashna been given 
So, those patients who develop respiratory infection, those who do not res develop respiratory infection, you also have the controls, those who are not taking the Swarnamrita Prashana, though again there is chances that those who develop respiratory infection and those who do not suffer with respiratory infections. So, you can always do such studies and uh, like you can apply the appropriate statistical test. Like for example, for case control study, we always often have to calculate something called as odds ratio as a statistical method and for cohort study, a relative risk ratio or risk ratio can be calculated as an appropriate statistical methods. So, these are some of the things that you need to know. Apart from this, the most oftenly used method in the contemporary medical research is a randomized control trials uh, where you have a control group and a standard group uh, and an interventional group. You do some form of intervention and try to compare the outcome. So, Basically, the, the studies, the study design, especially the epidemiological study design is divided into two observational studies designs and the intervention study designs. The observational study designs can be divided into descriptive and analytical. So, observational are those where you not, do not have any active intervention. You just observe the, the cases or observe the subjects or participants. It is of two types, descriptive and analytical descriptive where you do not have a comparator, it could be in the form of case report, case series or any cross sectional uh, observational study, whereas the analytical is generally will not will have a, uh, a control like a cross sectional control study, a case control study, a cohort with concurrent or without concurrent uh, controls or hybrid designs etc. And uh, in case of interventional, there could be the various types of clinical trials which could be randomized clinical trials or non-randomized clinical trials, field trials, community intervention studies, etc. So, we will be coming up uh, one more detailed presentation or session on the study designs where we are going to uh, discuss the merits and demerits of all this with suitable examples. But as of now, if we can have some basic knowledge about these study designs, I think it should be essential and it should be enough for the present situation. So, up, moving on to the next benefit or next application of biostatistics is the sampling methods or the sampling techniques. So, basically what do you mean by sampling method or sampling technique? So, the appropriate method used to select the sample from the population is called as sampling method or sampling technique based on the type of the data collection whether it is a qualitative data or a quantitative data and what is your research question and what is the most appropriate study design. Based on that, you always have a systematic method of collecting the sample from the population. And very importantly, this sample that is collected should be a representative part of the population. And uh, the sampling technique or the sampling method can be selected based on the research design or the study design based on the type of data like whether it is a qualitative data or a quantitative data like for example if it is a qualitative data we often use the non probability or non random sampling methods if it is a quantitative data we often use the random sampling methods and also it may depend upon the sample size so what are the basic steps that we have as a so, this step that we have in collecting the sample from the population is called as sampling process and it mainly has seven important steps when we collect the sample from the population. The first one is to define the target population on whom we would like to work. Like for example, see people suffering with diabetes mellitus is a target population, but we may not select all the type of diabetes mellitus, maybe type 2 diabetes mellitus age between the 30 to 40 of recent origin less than 3 years will be selected and they become our sampling frame. Okay? So, the first is to define the target population and from them based on the specific diagnostic criteria, inclusion criteria, exclusion criteria, we fix the sampling frame and from this based on the type of data, you can determine whether you go with a probability sampling method or a non-probability sampling method. 
I'll talk about these two terms, probability and non-probability, or they're also called as random sampling or non-random sampling. Probability is known as random sampling and non-probability is known as non-random sampling method. And then plan the procedure for selecting the sampling methods, which type or which method of probability sampling, because there are again subtypes or different types of probability and non-probability sampling methods, like simple random, stratified random, quota sampling, judgmental sampling, etc. So which appropriate method you are going to select will be determined in the fourth step. Then you can always determine on how many samples we are going to study based on the sample size calculation. Then do, then do the select the actual sampling units. So those who will be selected from the samples are called as sampling units. And then on these sampling units, you are going to conduct the from the sampling units, you are going to pick the samples and on the samples, you are going to do the actual research. So these are the, the seven important steps that we come across in the sampling process. Now coming to the basic sampling classification, which I told earlier as the probability sampling and the non-probability sampling, also called as random sampling and the non-random sampling. So what do you mean by this? What is probability samples or what is probability sampling method? Ones in which members of the population have a known chance of being selected. Like suppose there is a classroom of 100 students and suppose we ask them each one of them to write their name and put in a box and we would like to pick two samples from this particular population of 100. So who has the chance of getting selected? Obviously, anybody from the whole class has a chance, but the whole class may not be selected because our sample size is just two. Okay, So only two of them will be selected, but this two can be anyone among the hundred. So when equal chances are being given to be selected and when you select based on the sample size, it is called as probability sampling methods or the random sampling methods which is very often used for the quantitative data collection. Whereas the non-probability samples or non-probability sampling methods, also called as non-random sampling methods, instances in which the chances of selecting the members from the population are not known. You select based on the requirement, based on the need, based on the purpose, based on the attitudes or beliefs. Whenever you select the samples, like you have something called as purposive sampling okay, or you have something called as convenient sampling. So where you are doing based on some specific purpose or based on the convenience of the investigator but not giving equal chance for all the participant or all the, uh, the population being selected. Then these methods are called as non-probability sampling. See uh, each one of these methods has its own merits and demerits. It is not that it is always the probability sampling which is always better. But it depends upon the type of data that we are selecting time to select because for uh, selecting a qualitative data, then most often we go with the non-probability sampling methods. So it depends upon the, the study design and the data type that we are selecting in case of selecting the most appropriate sampling methods. So as discussed earlier, there are different types of sampling techniques or sampling methods which could broadly be classified into the probability sampling and the non-probability sampling. Uh, this is what uh, you can see that uh, there is something called as the probability sampling which is also called as the random sampling techniques which has various types like you have simple random techniques and the systematic random techniques also called as the interval sampling technique stratified where divide into groups. Then you have cluster sampling methods and there are other sampling like multiphasic, multi-stage sampling techniques, etc. Then under the non-probability sampling or the non-random sampling, we have convenience sampling, judgmental sampling, quota sampling, snowball sampling, etc. So these are the different types of the sampling techniques which one should be aware of whenever we are selecting the sampling uh, methods, whenever you are selecting the sampling techniques in any research. So again, uh, we are going to talk in detail uh, about this uh, 
concept of sampling methods. Uh, each one of these uh, types of the sampling techniques will be dealt in detail with appropriate uh, practical examples and how we can uh, use them in Ayurveda research. We will do uh, one more session on that. But as of now, if we can know the basic aspects that the sampling methods is basically divided into two probability sampling and non probability sampling and there are different common methods or types of probability and non probability sampling methods i think this would be sufficient as on now so with this uh, we conclude this part of the presentation on application of biostatistics in ayurveda research so we will continue with few more important concepts in the upcoming session